usually a person watching TV is somebody who has not figured out what they want to do with their life. Because once you've decided what you want to do with your life, your time becomes precious and you want to focus your energy. And that's actually the, one of the great secrets of achievement. The people who are great achievers, they know who they are, they know what they want to do, and they pursue it. Versus if you're just kind of like, oh, well, man, what time is it? Oh, I'll just watch this show. That's a sign that you don't have your goals correct. Because when you have your goals correct, time becomes quite precious and you don't want to waste it. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Sen, and today I have the honor of having back on Dr. Peter Rogers, who is now a monthly guest. Peter Rogers has been a Stanford and Harvard-educated neuroradiologist and imaging-guided surgeon for over 30 years. On his own YouTube channel, he lectures on nutrition, toxicology, and more. Today, we'll be covering questions on these topics, many submitted ahead of time from the audience. The first question is, how much fruit should someone who is moderately active eat? As you say, sweet foods like bananas and beet juice are good for a pre-workout meal before lifting weights, but sweets can also lead to rebound hypoglycemia, which the body senses as starvation, and thus it releases triglycerides fat into the blood. Yeah, the really sweet ones, like we're saying, get rebound hypoglycemia. The pancreas overcompensates. And it'll drive your blood glucose down so low that you'll need to eat some more sugar right away. And you'll end up with a roller coaster like blood glucose curve. That can cause obesity. Plus, it can cause, you know, visual symptoms, scintillating scotomata and difficulty driving and other problems. So that's not good. Um, I think it kind of depends on how active you are. I know you mentioned moderately active. But, for example, there's a lot of people who do, you know, marathons, triathlons, and they'll eat tons of fruits. There's a famous guy by the name of Michael Arnstein. He runs ultra marathons and he talks about eating 25 to 30 pounds of fruit a day. So what I'm saying is if you really don't exercise much and you eat lots of fruit, you can get addicted to it and you can become fat. Okay. So that'd be the potential problem. Like I know I can eat 10 apples like that without even thinking about it. And I'll still want more. And then I, I actually stopped eating apples because I found it hard to control myself. I keep, I would keep eating the whole pack of 10 and I'm like, and I do it really fast. And I'm like, how did I do that? I wondered if they sprayed MSG on them. Um, fruits are more expensive compared to eating starches, for example. So you could find yourself spending a lot of money. Plus fruits don't store very long, most of them, other than frozen fruits. So you, can, you keep having to go to the store quite often. So that's another downside of fruits. But if you were rich, um, I would say, yeah, I love eating fruits. And I think they're healthier than they get credit for. The amount of fructose in them is not that high. They come packaged with the fiber and the antioxidants. And there's lots of really healthy people who eat tons of fruit. For example, you look at the Mastering Diabetes guys. Um, you know who they are, Bobby Bittero and I think Cyrus Sorry. Kumbata. And stuff. Yeah, yeah. And they're real healthy guys eating a lot of fruits and having good control of their diabetes. Okay, they got type 1 diabetes. So what I've seen is the people who tend to exercise more will eat tons of fruit. Because I realize there's controversies here. For example, there's a guy named Doug Graham who wrote the 801010 book. And he talks about eating entirely raw diet. And then there's almost the opposite end of the spectrum. Dr. McDougall who says, no, no, no. You should get 90% of your calories from starches. And I think a lot of times Dr. McDougall is dealing with older patients who don't exercise hardly at all. And they come to him sick. And he wants to kind of get them out of their sickness as fast as he can. Me personally, I eat about 35% of my calories from fruit. So I can't give you an exact percentage. And I would also partly go by, how are you doing? Are you reasonably thin and fit and energetic? If you are, and you're eating a lot of fruit, then, you know, it sounds like it's working for you. I don't see a fixed amount. Um, I, I don't think it is. And like I said, there's some people who are almost fruitarians. And I've also seen the pattern, you know, like uh, Ruth Hydrich, she was a lady with breast cancer, diagnosed at 42 years of age, metastatic. She's still alive, you know, over 30, 40 years later, running, you know, long distance races. And she switched to eating almost completely raw. There's a convenience to eating raw. When you eat raw foods, you don't have to cook. It's easy to clean up. And I also notice, I think you might get a benefit of more potassium. For example, when you boil a food, you boil a starch, you lose about half the potassium or more. So when you eat the fruits, you're getting a lot of potassium. It's nice to have a high ratio of potassium to sodium. I think that might be part of why raw fruits uh, can be surprisingly healthy. Plus, you think about a fruit. A fruit is very low in protein. Low protein means low in amino acids. Low amino acids means the food's relatively alkaline. So alkaline is good. Low in fat is good. Low in protein is good. Those are signs of a healthy food. And I think the reason we have color vision is so we can see when fruits are um, in, when they're ripe perhaps even to see the variety of colors, the so-called antioxidants and whatnot. So what I'm trying to say is I think fruits are better than they're usually given credit for. Uh, but, you know, 
the biggest limitation to eating them is in the wild, they're more seasonal versus nowadays, of course, you can go to the store. But I think in the wild, unless you lived in a tropical place, you know, they're not always going to be available. Right. And sometimes people talk about how you should look toward your ancestors and follow their dietary pattern. So if your ancestors didn't come from the tropics, would you say that those people should be eating less fruit or that it really is just case by case? You got to see how you feel. Yeah, I mean, I think the nutrients in fruits are pretty good. Um, I think all of our ancestors ate almost entirely plant foods and they ate whatever was available. Um, so I, I actually don't think it matters that much. I think right. some of the modern fruits too, they're, they're, they're sort of been bred genetically to be sweeter, you know, that it's a more profitable crop. So I think they're a little bit unnaturally sweet, if you will, some of the modern stuff. But at the same time, I've seen a lot of people who talk about all the bananas they eat all day and these other sweet fruits, and they're still real skinny. So I don't see a lot of obese fruitarians walking around. I see, uh, nor do I see, you know, starchivores tend to do quite well also. But if I, like I said, if I was perfectly rich and had all the time in the world, I would eat even more fruit, I think. Gotcha. And some people who are on this more like fruitarian diet, there are concerns about things like increased bacterial infections, increased tooth decay. Have you heard about those concerns? Well, I've heard, I've heard about people saying you can get more tooth decay. Certainly if you eat, I do know this, I once had a cavity in between two teeth. And if I would eat sweet fruits, I would have to, you know, rinse my mouth out real fast, brush my teeth, floss right away, or that cavity would hurt. It wouldn't hurt right away after, let's say, a starch-like food. This was actually many years ago, Okay. Uh, so sweeter fruits will do that. You know, things that are real sweet or real acidic, like soda pops, one of the worst things because it's sticky. It's acidic from the phosphoric acid, you know, the carbonation. And it's also uh, super sweet. You know, how, like you spill it on a table and it sticks. So that's really bad for tooth decay. You know, contrary though, like that guy, Mike Arnstein, I've seen a bunch of his videos, the ultra marathon runner guy who eats all the fruit. He says he's got perfect teeth. He's, he has a big smile with nice teeth. And if you look at the work of, a, you know, it was a, Weston Price, you know, back in the 1920s and 30s, he's a dentist, traveled all over the world. He said, any population eating its endemic diet, none of them have problems with cavities, okay? Even if there was more or less amounts of meat. It's the modern sweets and, you know, the, the white bread, the processed food, the refined sugars, and also the acidities that come. Like, you know, orange juice, as it's sold in a store, is unnatural, and it's excessively sweet and acidic. I can remember when I had that cavity, that would, like, make it hurt faster than anything. Um, so... I think if you're eating just not such sweet, like I like blueberries, for example, because they still taste real good, but they're not excessively sweet. They're really healthy. They got lots of concentrated antioxidants and whatnot. They can be frozen. So they're convenient for storage in that sense as well. Gotcha. And some people also have concerns about having enough fat intake while on a more raw diet. I'm assuming that you would say that's not an issue because through fiber, you can get fat and things like that. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of, there's enough fat in fruits by that. I mean, for example, the best starches are things like potatoes, sweet potatoes and rice. As far as I'm concerned, those are 1% fat. That's low fat, 1% fat. So if fruits have more fat than that. I mean, it'll vary, let's say in the ballpark around three to 5%. So there's no such thing as being too low in fat. I think, by the way, I think that whole idea of good fats is all nonsense and BS. It's just marketing. It's a marketing slogan to make you think you need to eat more fat stuff. I, I don't think it's true at all because there's been uh, several different studies of feeding people less than 1% fat and they did quite well. I remember one's called them a clean study. One's, one was a white study. And then there's another paper too. You know, and Dennis Pritik and Nathan Pritikin had said, it's impossible to be too low in fat. Forget about it. And McDougal will tell you too, you're getting plenty of omega-3s from your plant foods. And I looked it up. I'd agree with that from my study of the subject. Forget about fat. It's a non-issue. And also forget about protein. It's impossible to be too low in protein. Breast milk is 5% to 6% protein. And that's when our most rapid phase of growth. So we're always going to need less at that time. And if you look at, there's been populations where they fed them, you know, these uh, controlled diets of two and a half percent protein and starving people, and they fed them back to health. They did great on that, two and a half percent protein. And if you look at the Kempner study, he was only feeding about 4.4% protein and his patients did fantastic. So what I'm saying is it's impossible to be too low in protein or in fat. And I would consider those non-issues. Right. And when people talk about having the right combination of amino acids for protein or the omega-3, omega-6 ratio balance for fats, you're saying that that's all, none of that really matters? That's what I'm saying. Yes. Cool. Awesome. That makes it a lot simpler for everybody. So that's great. Some doctors say that females do need to have more fat than males to feel satiated. Have you ever heard about this? I've never, I've never heard that before. Uh, you know, 
Um, I would say, for example, I eat the OMAD diet on my work days, means one meal a day. I don't feel hungry. I'm perfectly fine. I mean, I'll, I typically eat a decent amount of beans. Um, but the reason why I'm so confident is because they've done a lot of studies on seeing when does a person start going into ketosis. And it's usually after about 48 hours. So if you avoid the simple sugars, because those will put you in the rebound hypoglycemia, they'll make you want to eat sooner. You should be fine just by eating some starches and some fruits. Um, like I said, I'll typically eat the starches first, then I'll have the fruits, and then I'll have the salad to follow. And I've been doing it for years. My energy is great all day. Um, mm -hmm. The big thing that helped me too was I quit caffeine. If you drink caffeine in the morning, you might get a little energy boost from that because it mimics a stress response, but you'll typically get a bit of a crash in the afternoon and then you feel kind of lousy. And sometimes you think, because I feel lousy and tired, maybe I need to eat something. But in my experience, it's not really hunger. It's just a question of you're getting a, a rebound effect from the caffeine uh, come wearing off in your blood, so to speak. So you don't go into ketosis till about 48 hours, you start going to ketosis. You can run primarily on glycogen initially, and then more and more gluconeogenesis, the re-synthesis uh, of glucose in your liver um, easily for 24 hours, easy, walk in the park and 48 hours, pretty good. So what I'm saying is for me to just eat one meal a day, dinner, I just eat dinner because I, I don't eat in the morning because I don't want to have to wake up early and prepared and everything that goes with it. I only eat one meal a day on a work day just because it saves me a lot of time. I don't think it's the healthiest thing in the world. I just think it's the most convenient thing. By eating only one meal, I get it all over with in one meal. Versus let's say I have a day off. When I have a day off, I typically want to do my most intellectual work first thing in the morning. A person is always smartest in the morning because your brain cleans itself at night through the glymphatic system. So all your neuronal waste products have been cleared away. Your neurons are ready to go. You get a little boost of cortisol, just a little bit, enough to maintain good blood glucose level. You get ghrelin from your stomach, G for ghrelin, G for gastric, and it sort of activates the hippocampus to make you more alert. Plus, you think about it from a biological evolutionary point of view. When does an animal need to be smart? When it's hungry, you break fast. You've been fasting overnight. So basically, you're programmed to be intelligent, to go find food. And that's the time to do whatever challenging academic work you want to do. I usually am trying to answer a question, you know, what causes diabetes or something when I wake up in the morning, or I'm trying to write a book chapter, or I'm preparing a lecture or something like that. So I always want to do my intellectual work first, because I know from experience, if you eat first, then you sometimes want to take a nap. Um, if you go work out first, sometimes that ends up taking longer than you think. You get in a big conversation with somebody you see at the gym or something. So you end up sort of putzing around on your morning. And as soon as you eat a lunch or a brunch or whatever you want to call it, that meal, your IQ drops about 20, 30 points. You're, a lot of times you're a little bit tired postprandial. You want to take a quick nap or you just, you just don't quite have it all together intellectually after that. So if you value high level intellectual achievement, you want to not eat breakfast is my opinion. You want to save that for later. And then I'll eat a brunch almost like as a study break. I'll often walk around a little bit, get some exercise. And I'll often eat what I would call the wet foods for the for the sort of the early lunch. Wet foods mean let's say oatmeal or something, because that's you're, if you ate that right before you go to bed, you'd be more likely to have to wake up the void. Okay, so I would rather not eat wet food like oatmeal, so to speak, at night before going to bed. Um, and that's sort of the logic of it. Right. And when you first transitioned to eating OMAD one meal a day, did you deal with hunger at all? Because everybody asks about the hunger, and I know you don't feel it now, but when you first transitioned, right. Um, well, I didn't have any hunger, I think, because I've avoided the effect of rebound hypoglycemia, like I talked about, by avoiding sweets. And I know my glycogen's perfect. Also, beans have the longest satiety effect of any food. And I'm pretty routinely eating beans. But I know lots of times, if let's say there's not beans available, I'm still fine. Also, I know from, I've looked at the charts, your body's great at maintaining its blood glucose levels for 24 to 48 hours, especially 24 is a walk in the park. So you're fine. Um, I, I, you know, and maybe it's also because I don't have caffeine. Caffeine can cause a bit of a rebound hypoglycemia like effect and coming out of it, you'll sometimes want to eat. Try not to be sleep deprived. For me, it's completely a non-issue. I kind of work like a robot, man. I just crank out the work. A lot of times I'm super busy. Um, and I just feel good. I think once you get used to it, so eat some beans, increase your prolonged satiety, avoid the sweets, and I think you'll find it works quite well. I, I believe it, it gives me about an extra hour and a half, two hours every day. Because when I was eating twice a day on my work days, I would find that I didn't have much time. I was more likely to be sleep deprived. And now I sleep more. I like it. Nice. There's only one catch. I'll actually share it. What's the one catch? When you're eating the OMAD diet, 
you're if you, and you're gonna because you're still gonna eat a lot of food to get all your calories in one meal. And a lot of starches are a little bit wet in the sense like rice has got some water in it, certainly potatoes and some of the fruits and whatnot. You're more likely to have to wake up the void. So that interrupts your sleep a little bit. So in a perfect world, like let's say on a day off, I'll eat the more wet fluidy foods for lunch rather than for dinner. So that's the one downside of the OMAD, but it still ends up working because I've done it and not done it for years with work. I know I have a lot more time to sleep and to uh, do everything else I want to do by eating the OMAD, by only having one meal a day. That's why I do it. Nice. And how close to bedtime do you eat that meal? Well, pretty much I get done from work. I come home and I just eat right then. And I, it'll, it'll be like, if I eat a meal in the daytime, um, then, I, you know, everyone else in my house was awake and I walk around in circles and I actually get a lot of exercise because I walk during the entire meal. Uh, usually I'm eating by myself. Everybody's home, but I'm by myself eating and I'll walk in circles around the different rooms and stuff. And so it's, it's for me, it's like an exercise workout. I'm getting, I'm standing up and walking instead of sitting at my desk doing some type of academic intellectual thing. Um, so, and then I also have to go up and I have the way my house is set up. I have to go up and down a lot of stairs. It kind of came down to many years ago, my wife and I had a discussion who's going to get what bathroom. Each of us wanted our own bathroom. And so she thought she was the big victor by getting the ground floor bathroom, but it worked out perfect for me because I have to constantly go upstairs, downstairs, upstairs, downstairs, basement, up and down. I get tons of exercise during the day, walking stairs. I actually wanted it that way. I always, you know, part of being marriage as a man gets a little smarter in marriage. He learns to act disappointed. Oh yeah. Okay. Sweetheart. Fine. You could have the ground floor bathroom. That way she feels like she owes me something, you know? Um, but it was a victory for me because I'm constantly getting all this exercise. And for me, that lunch is a, is a good exercise workout. And then I had clean my teeth with interdental brushes. I'll get a lot of walking, you know, maybe 40 minutes of walking um, just from that. You know, of course, if you're eating it as a family dinner, it's nice to sit down and talk. But I think in reality, a lot of people have busy schedules. Everybody in the family has a different schedule. And, you know, if you can walk around and get exercise, that's great. At night, um, a lot of times I'll watch internet videos um, for educational purposes, whatever. So then I don't get as much exercise. And it just, for some reason, seems like a lot of times the way all the people in the house are in their little spots, whatever it might be, it's harder to walk around. You know, if I walk through the room, they go, get out of here, you know? So, so it's just easier to get to walking in the afternoon, usually when there's more free space. I love that. You're hilarious. You say you eat OMAD out of convenience because it saves yep. you time. Some people eat the same amount of calories, but grazing on the food throughout the day. Do you think there is a health benefit to eating just once instead of eating multiple smaller meals throughout the day? Uh, theoretically, there might be. There might be the idea that you're basically not, for example, let's say somebody ate more fat. I eat almost, I eat super low fat. My the percent of fat in my diet is probably around, I don't know, I wouldn't guess 6% or something. It's low because I don't eat any high fat foods. Um, but let's say you were eating high fat food. You'll have a time curve at which the fat clears out of your blood. And you want fat. You want your, your blood to not be, have a high amount of fat in it. And also your liver, it helps your liver to kind of cool off, if you will. Because so like the worst thing to do is eat three high fat, high sodium meals a day, because then you're always going to have high levels of fat in your blood, predisposing you to hypertension, atherosclerosis, you know, coronary artery disease, stroke, all these other bad things and cognitive impairment, you know, over the course of decades. So basically you're in a sense, you're doing time restricted eating. When you do OMAD diet, you're only eating once a day. That's time restricted eating. So you got 24 hours between meals that gives your body a lot of time to sort of handle the consequences of eating. You know, you have transient increased oxidative stress and things like that. So you can make that argument. Um, I, I, I don't do it though for the health reasons. And I don't do it because of the time restricted eating. I just do it because it magically creates an extra hour. After you eat, you have to go to the bathroom, you have to clean your teeth, you have to prepare the meal, you have to clean up a little bit. All that takes time. So if you only do that once, uh, you save a lot of time. And it's a lot. It's about an hour and a half, two hours sometimes even. So that's why I like it. I know I can wake, I can sleep much later before I have to wake up in the morning and go to work. Um, it's for the convenience. That's why I do it. Gotcha. And on the subject of sleep, somebody wanted to know what should they do if they have trouble falling asleep and okay, they are well, following a healthy diet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Falling asleep is one thing. Well, first of all, no caffeine. Caffeine is totally overrated. It's kind of for chumps. And I know everybody thinks caffeine is cool. You know, it's like if you, if you go into any academic 
community. Everybody's always drinking coffee, including all the senior professor types. And everybody thinks drinking coffee is cool. In my opinion, once you study it, it's actually kind of stupid because all it does is mimic the acute stress response. People say, oh, I'm stressed out. I need a cup of coffee. No, you're just increasing your stress level, so to speak. It's the same hormones. You increase cortisol, you increase catecholamines, adrenaline, noradrenaline. So you don't want to do that. And it has a half-life about you know eight hours. So it's not fully out of your system by the time you go to bed at night. So you tend to not sleep as deeply. It's the restorative deep sleep. The deep sleep's more restorative. That's what you want. That's what makes you feel good. Like I know if I even sleep four hours, I'm like, I'll be fine at work tomorrow. I'll be sharp. Everything's going to be good. Just if I get four hours, don't get me wrong. I'll be at my best if I get six or seven or even eight, but I know I'm going to be good. I'm going to be solid because I sometimes have to work intensely for a long amount of time, like nine hours straight intensely. And I know if I got four hours of sleep, I'm good. Rock and roll. I'll just crank it out. There won't be a remote issue. Okay. So what am I trying to say though, is um, if you drink the caffeine, you often don't sleep quite as deep. You'll have laid down on the bed, but you don't have that same restorative feeling as deeply as you do. Okay. So that's one thing. Number two, some of these other things have a mild stimulant effect. Like I think MSG should be avoided and MFG manufactured free glutamate. And you avoid that by eating the processed foods. The processed foods will have those in there. And the reason I get into that is an excitatory neurotransmitter. About 75% of the neurotransmitters in the brain are glutamates, excitatory neurotransmitter, excitatory because it activates the postsynaptic neuron. And these things are thought to potentially predispose a little bit to anxiety. Some people are more sensitive to them than others. Maybe in some person, a little more of it gets across the blood-brain barrier. And that can potentially decrease your depth of sleep. Also, no alcohol. Alcohol is bad. Even though people think, oh, if I drink alcohol, I can sleep better. You might fall asleep better, but it'll often cause insomnia, whereby you wake up in the middle of the night and you have difficulty going back to sleep. So I'd recommend zero alcohol. Also, I would purchase low watt light bulbs for the areas you have to go at night, like in your bathroom, use a minimal light bulb, you know, or even if there's a light in the shower and then you have a shower curtain, just you, you want the least amount of light at night. Try not to be around bright lights at night, especially it's worse effect in terms of decreasing your melatonin. Your melatonin is made in your pineal gland and that's sort of like the sleep hormone. It's the counterweight of seesaw to uh, cortisol. Cortisol is the wake up and get your butt moving hormone. Melatonin is the, like mellow out and go to sleep hormone. So what I'm saying is bright light in a sense tells your body it's noontime. It's time in the day to go out and do stuff versus dim lights help your melatonin production increase. And it takes a couple of hours for that to ramp up. So keeping the, the lights around you as low as possible. Like I go to bed earlier than my family and I'm constantly telling them, you know, what do you guys think this is? Las Vegas, you're ruining my melatonin. Turn up that light. You know, what do you need the bright light on the dimmer? You don't need to put it all the way up. You know, it's kind of like <laughs> typical things in my household. I go, have you learned nothing about melatonin? How many years have I been telling you? You know, <laughs> so. Maybe you could, I don't know, wear a hat indoors, put on blue light blocking yeah, glasses. Yeah, some people glasses. wear these like blue, uh, these you know, like uh, sunglasses yeah, these, that, these. that remove blue light. Yeah, you know, that might help. So these are all some of the ways. The other thing too I found that helps is avoid doing anything stressful. You know what I'm saying? So for example, you might go over to Facebook and some of these people are acting like jerks and you might want to tell them you guys are jerks and then they're going to argue back and say, no, you're a jerk. No, don't do that at night. Don't, don't do anything that you're going to perseverate about and think, should I have really done that? Maybe that wasn't stupid. So avoid you know, any type of unnecessary conversations that might annoy you. Don't watch anything on TV or the news or anything that might stress you out. If you know that it might do that, then just avoid it. So you don't, you don't want any unnecessary stress. You want sort of a peaceful, quiet, go off in the bed type of routine. Gotcha. So do you tend to avoid devices at night? I know you watch the internet yeah, videos. No electronics in the bedroom. I actually don't think you should be watching TV. I think TV is kind of like for stupid people. And, and the reason I say that is it has to be sort of dumbed down in order to have its commercials be marketable. And they have to make this generic content that applies to the masses. You can go on a computer and very quickly find a lot of good content about precise things that might be of interest to you. So what I'm trying to say is, and the old joke Steve Jobs used to say this, is when you turn on a TV, you turn off your brain. When you turn on a computer, you turn on your brain. You know, there is some, some brightness to a computer screen. It's good to have your background kind of dim so you're not excessively bright lights too. But what I am trying to say is, usually a person watching TV is somebody who has not figured out what they want to do with their life. Because once you've decided what you want to do with your life, your time becomes precious and you want to focus your energy. 
And that's actually the, one of the great secrets of achievement. The people who are great achievers, they know who they are, they know what they want to do, and they pursue it. Versus if you're just kind of like, oh, well, man, what time is it? Oh, I'll just watch this show. That's a sign that you don't have your goals correct. Because when you have your goals correct, time becomes quite precious and you don't want to waste it. Absolutely. And someone wanted to know what should they do if they fall asleep fine, but they wake up too early and they can't fall back asleep? Right. Well, some of the things that'll do that are, you know, too much liquids at night so that you wake up and you have to void, you know, they call it nature's alarm clock is a full bladder. And that's more of a problem for men as they get older, especially if they got an enlarged prostate because then their bladder volume is decreased. Um, alcohol has a tendency to make people wake up in the middle of the night. Having caffeine earlier in the day has a tendency to cause that. Having your room kind of quiet. Another thing that's a little bit of a trick was anything you read is always going to tell you, have the room cool. You know, it gets cooler at night in nature. We're used to sleeping in a cooler temperature than the daytime temperature. Yeah, fine. But here's a little secret. I like it to be kind of hot given why I have the first choice. And by the way, it gets my family pissed off because when I'm warm, I might sweat a little bit at night, but guess what? My attitude is anything I sweat, that's something I don't need to wake up and void, okay? I'm, I, know, I know if the room is a little warmer, I wake up one less time per night, void less, and I sleep more deeply through the night. So that works for me, even though that's not what you're gonna hear in the book. If you make it too cold, the colder it is, the more your skin vasoconstricts and the, the fluid is concentrated centrally in your body, so to speak, and your kidney excretes more fluid. So you're more likely to have to wake up to void. So that's a little trick that can help with that. Sometimes, like, let's say your family's making a lot of noise. They're annoying, okay? What can you do? You could yell at them a little bit, but they'll probably ignore you. You could tell them, you know, take the dog with you because if the dog's in one room and they're in the other room, the dog wants to be with them and it won't stop barking until it's with them. So tell them to take the dog. Um, the other thing to do is you can put the, if you put the heater on, that's one other reason why I like it a little hotter is because the, the noise of the heater helps drown out their noise. So I don't hear them as much. Um, you can also get a humidifier or an air filter, a HEPA air filter, and put that thing on and put it near your door, again, as a distractor to uh, sort of like, you know, white noise, if you were monotonous, to block out the sound that they are making. Uh, that can also be helpful. Uh, I like the room to be pretty dark. It should be just dark enough that you could barely see the wall, you know, just enough that you don't bump into stuff and hurt yourself, uh, but still quite dark. Uh, your alarm clock should have red, uh, red on it, not blue. The blue is like middle of the day, sky blue. That's what, that's what wakes you up. It's the red, you know, like you go to the zoo, the nocturnal animals are all in red. So that's more like sleep. That's more natural for us. And like I said, too, overhead lights are a lot worse because that's like the sun coming down on you. That's processed differently by your brain. You'll notice that if you take the same light, you put it up on top of a table, it annoys you more at night with your melatonin than if it was on the ground. And I think that's because Light from above meant the sun, and that tells us decreased melatonin versus light coming from the ground. I think humans have had fire for many, 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 many thousands of years, however many years it is. But for some reason, it just doesn't have the same effect when that light comes from, you know, below shoulder level, let's say. So that's that's much better tolerated. I see. I see. And back on the subject of food. Most, if not all, the plant-based doctors say that the benefits of soy outweigh the risks. And you, of course, have made many videos explaining how the papers are debunked, the sources are not great, they're all biased. However, people still want to hear. I think the purpose of soy is to sterilize chumps, okay? If you look at it, you say, you say whenever something tends to be subsidized, that almost always means it's bad. All right. And let me go into this a little bit. Soy causes deformities of the female reproductive system. Okay. It lowers male sperm counts. It's highly estrogenic. Who the heck knows what's in the GMO component of that? It's sprayed typically with almost the vast majority of it is GMO sprayed with that glyphosate, phosphate, glyphosate roundup stuff, which is a toxic thing. It's named glyphosate, very much like the amino acid glycine with an additional phosphate on it. There's a little more to that, but that you can basically think of that as being its structure. Glycine is the amino acid with the simplest, smallest side chain, just has a hydrogen, okay? But with glyphosate, you put a phosphate in place of that hydrogen. So now it's bulkier. Not only is it bulkier from the phosphate, you know, it's like the phosphate with some oxygens around it, the phosphorus with oxygens around it, but it also has a negative charge. And now... What's thought to be the mechanism, there's different mechanisms, but the most common one, there's a lady by the name of Senef, and, and 
MIT PhD who writes a lot about this, is that it can substitute for glycine in a protein. Glycine is very commonly in enzyme active sites because of that small side chain. It creates space in the pocket. And now you got this big phosphate sticking up there with its bulkiness and its negative charge, and it repels the ligand from binding to the enzyme active site. So what am I saying? According to Senef, and it seems plausible, it's messing up the function of a bunch of enzymes by substituting for glycine. Okay, so you're, you're, you're screwing up your metabolism. I think that's a bad idea. And it's very often processed with hexane. That's a neurotoxin. Okay, so why would I want that? And it tends to cause hypothyroid. You know, where does it come from? You know, I've talked about this before is, you know, women have a lot of estrogen. Okay, but women do something with that estrogen. They've got breasts. They got a Virginia down below. Okay, I understand why a woman has a lot of estrogen. Does soy have a Virginia? <laughs> does soy have big breasts? Not that I've ever seen. So why does it have estrogen off the chart like 10,000 times more than other plants? Maybe because soy doesn't want to be eaten. Maybe a lot of fruits and berries and stuff, you know, they want to be eaten. The bear eats them. The bear walks a couple miles away, defecates, and now the new fruit tree, berry tree will grow or bush. Okay, it's not like that with soy doesn't want to be eaten. It's like, stop eating me, okay? I'm going to make you infertile. What is a birth control pill? High estrogen. So what is soy? Tons of estrogen. So when it gives tons of estrogen to the animal that eats it, that'll interfere with the animal's reproductive system. It'll make it infertile. Plus it'll make it hypothyroid. So the baby's retarded, okay? It's not a good thing, okay? The more you look at this, you'll see that. When you start looking a little closer at the soy, and I went through tons of papers, you'll see things like, gee, the paper that says it doesn't have any estrogenic effects was written by the head of the soy industry, <laughs> okay? And I, it'd be hard to be more at risk for bias than that, okay? And then go back and read all these animal papers. You're gonna see all these animals are messed up. Go back and read these papers in the 1950s and 60s, hypothyroid, hypothyroid, hypothyroid. Um, look at the mouse studies. You'll get the truth when you go back and you read a lot of old studies. There wasn't there wasn't any money, anything that's worth billions of dollars commercially nowadays. It has its own. There was an expression by Winston Churchill. The truth must have a bodyguard of lies. OK, and what I'm trying to say is all these commercial products, caffeine, tea, soy, MSG, they got all this BS fake marketing publicity around them that hides the reality of what they are. All right. So basically, like I said, I think it's just sterilized chumps. It's like my father used to say to me, like, I would do something stupid. And you go, you just failed your instant IQ test. OK, so basically, if you're stupid enough to eat it, you deserve to be infertile. I think that's kind of like what's being said between the lines with soy. So I, my advice is avoid it. And then people also say, well, there are a lot of Asian populations. They ate soy and they were fine. They lived a long life and they were healthy and they had plenty of babies. Well, I would say there's some validity to that argument. I think they were eating locally grown stuff, you know, from their backyard or their their community farm and stuff. There was no herbicide or pesticide on it. There was minimal processing of it. And I think in small amounts, it probably didn't have much harmful effect. But when people are eating more of it and it's GMO and it's highly processed and pesticide and herbicide sprayed, um, I think it becomes worse and worse uh, in that sense. Plus, you can eat a lot more of something when it's processed into becoming, let's say, you know, a soy milk or something. Versus if you had to, you know, pick the crop and make it into something yourself, you're probably not going to eat as much of it. Right. So even if the soy is organic, you would say that the risks outweigh the benefits? Yeah. And it also has heme iron in it. I'm, I'm looking at, I, I had done something. It lowers male sperm counts. Um, let's see if there's anything else. It has, it increases insulin like growth factor. It's, it, it, it pushes towards hypothyroidism potentially. There's reports of case reports hypothyroid and it, it increases the likelihood of hypothyroid becoming symptomatic. What's good there? Like I said, if there's anything that was that estrogenic, it would have to do my laundry for me, cook for me and please me in bed, or I want nothing to do with it, okay? I mean, <laughs> who needs all those problems? There's no compensatory benefit. I think soy is for chumps. I see. So some people do argue, for example, that soy seems to lower breast cancer risk, which is an anti-estrogenic effect. Some people also say it helps reduce menopausal hot flash symptoms, which is a pro-estrogenic effect. Would you say these effects are not valid? Well, a couple of things. I would be real suspect about its true benefit for cancer patients, okay? Because there's, there's a lot of things about it that are bad for physiology. And there's a good guy to read. His name is Dr. Anthony Jay. He's a PhD biochemist specializing in lipids. And he goes on and on, paper after paper, all the problems with soy. What then happens, and I've seen this happen with other food products, is the companies start getting richer and richer. And they're like, hey, 
There's all this bad press about our product. We need to have positive press. They'll buy the journal and they buy the scientists. Scientific research is totally biased. Just so people know, most of it's not true. I would say the vast majority of scientific literature is not true. That's an important point to realize. The reason is, imagine you're a PhD scientist. You have to please whoever is going to fund you. Otherwise, they'll never hire you again. And they'll actually give you a bad name in the industry. And you can't even get any work in that industry. And you'll have to change your field. So because of that, the scientist has to, uh, I would actually say, for example, I was a wrestler in college and we wanted to be good. We wanted to win the match. So I would always talk with the other wrestlers. Like we see a good wrestler. Like let's say a guy from, you know, Cal State Bakersfield, he comes in, Jesse Ray's doing an inside trip. It's cool. How does he set it up? We all wanted to learn and get good. And everybody had the same, the same goal. How can we do better and win? And medicine's not like that at all. Health is not like that at all. The food company wants money. It makes money by selling a product. It gets you to buy the product by you being convinced it's good for you, okay? The scientist wants money. The scientist has to get grant money to pay their bills, to keep their job, to get promoted at their university and get status, okay? The consumer wants food that tastes good, but they want food that keeps them healthy. So what I'm trying to say is the goals are all different there. And the big producer, the food company, they get their money with sales. So, and they've got lots of money, billions of dollars, these food companies. So they just buy the journal, they buy the scientists, and they buy the research. And that's why there's so much fake research. And so like, how can you know the truth? How can one see things objectively? And I think the things that help you look at epidemiology, we did mention there are some populations that ate a little bit of soy and they were fine. So I think in small amounts, it probably doesn't do much harm. Okay. And then also, um, the early studies on animals and the case reports and all these things that came out earlier, they were honest. There was no money involved. So I believe that stuff a lot more. And then I also, I look for a mechanism. Like the big thing you'll hear people say about soy is, well, it only activates the good estrogen receptor. It doesn't activate the bad estrogen receptor. Okay. There's ER alpha and ER beta. Like ER alpha, I think is the bad one. ER beta is the good one. Okay. But I remember the paper and I looked at that paper and it activated the, the bad receptor. It looked to me just about the same amount as a good receptor. That's BS. Okay. And there's also a bunch of case reports of premature puberty. So basically the secondary sex characteristics was thought to be the bad receptor because you don't want proliferation of breast ductal system because that potentially is associated with increased proliferation of breast tissue and breast cancer. And what I'm saying is there's plenty of stuff showing that it caused activation of that other receptor and premature puberty and stuff. So why wouldn't it increase the risk of breast cancer? So then all the stuff comes out later that, oh, it's a miracle food. Yeah, right. I don't believe it. I'm just telling you that and you can say there's always going to be some contradictory information and you have to look at the entire context and decide for yourself what you think the truth is. And I think there's so much negative stuff about it before big money got involved that I believe that. Right. And your research showed how ancestrally Asian populations ate a very negligible amount of soy in their diet, correct? Do you remember the percentage? Yeah, yeah. I, I remember the amounts were like 5% or something in that ballpark. And also look at Dr. McDougall. You got to remember something too. Dr. McDougall, I think he's probably the best overall nutrition doctor in the world. I've double checked his opinions lots of times against other doctors. He always ends up being right. But he's also careful. You know, I, I, just, I just do this as a hobby. You know, I'm, I don't do this as a business or anything. Nobody sponsors me, you know? So I used to use on my weekends because I find it fascinating and interesting. So what am I trying to say is he points out problems with soy, but he doesn't make a fuss about it. And he doesn't speak a lot about it. He's not going to speak about things that are bad for business, okay? Because when you speak bad about soy, people get pissed off. Like when I spoke bad about soy, just what I'm saying now, I got, you know, people wanted to kick me out of Facebook groups and stuff. It's, it's like a, I don't know how to say it, but it's kind of a little bit of a yuppie food. It's cool to be into soy. It's cool to drink soy. No, I think you're stupid. Okay. That's what I think. Okay. I don't care. It's the truth. I think, like I said, it's something that you fail your instant IQ test, you know, sterilize yourself, go ahead. But I think you're a chump. All right. I don't think soy is a good food. I would never touch it. All right. So on to a different food, beets. Beets are great for athletic performance. They're also high in oxalates, which some people say causes problems in the body. You do advocate for having beet juice a little bit before, say, an athletic event, so you perform better. What would you say is the maximum amount of beet juice or beets someone should intake? Well, I wouldn't have it every day. I just have it for two things. If I'm going to give a lecture, I know that it energizes me. The words come faster. I've given hundreds and hundreds of lectures. So I know the words come faster. I got more energy. So I like the beet juice for that purpose. I'll typically drink 32 ounces of it and chase it down with like 16 ounces of water, reverse osmosis water. So I also know I do, I do a lot of squatting. And when I go for my personal rep maximum and I do real high reps, I know I have a lot more energy when I, when I guzzle down that beet juice at least an hour and a half in advance. 
So then they say, well, what's the problem with beet juice? Theoretically, there's concern about oxalates, oxalic acid. Oxalate is just a deprotonated form of oxalic acid. It has a tendency to bind on to calcium, and it's thought that it'll increase your risk of kidney stones if you're eating lots of it every day. I still think that's pretty rare, but you know, what are the other things high in oxalates? There's Swiss chard and spinach and rhubarb. So you probably shouldn't eat that every day. Okay, once in a while is probably fine. So I would simply recommend have some beet juice when you got a, you know, organic beet juice when you got a something that you need that extra energy for, but I wouldn't do it every day. And that works out pretty well. All right. But once in a while, would you say like once a week, Max? Yeah, probably I would say maximum twice a week, but once a week, I think would be no big deal at all. Great. And you've mentioned in one video how dietary sodium can impact anxiety. Can you explain the mechanism how? I'm not sure about it, but I think that it would. I'll tell you why. A couple things. First of all, excessive dietary sodium tends to be associated with a high uh, risk of diabetes type diet, okay? Processed food and meat tend to have a lot more sodium in them. The meat, the salt's added to the meat to preserve it, for example. When you have insulin resistance, you also increase sympathetic autonomic nervous system. Increased insulin increases sympathetic autonomic nervous system. So that's going to make you a little more agitated, if you will, okay? In addition, high sodium, we're not made to eat high sodium. Our ancestors, I'm gonna bet, ate about 20 to 25%. We ate about this much uh, up here, potassium relative to sodium. But the modern processed food diet and high meat diet tends to be the opposite. We tend to be going far more sodium than potassium. That's bad. At least, at least double the amount of, uh, probably average about two and a half, three times as much sodium as potassium in the modern diets. That's all really bad when you want 20 times as much potassium. So what's my point? Every cell in the body, I drew a picture of this in one of my recent talks. I think they call it the K factor, meaning the ratio of K is for kalium. And that's the Latin word for potassium. Natrium is, you know, Na is the, the symbol in the, in the periodic table of elements for sodium. So what I'm trying to say is our plasma membrane ion pumps are designed to have 20 times as much potassium as sodium. And you need to maintain this high electrochemical gradient across all your plasma cell membranes because that's how the cell does all its work. That's the battery. That's the electricity of a cell. That's how it pumps calcium out of a cell. And you dissipate that gradient. Your body has to have a fixed ratio of potassium and sodium. If you eat more sodium, your potassium goes down. The reason is those are both cations, positively charged ions, and you have to maintain exact amounts inside a cell. The majority of your cations inside a cell are potassium and sodium. So when you eat more of one, you decrease the other one. And what happens then is you will dissipate that uh, electrochemical gradient for sodium and the cell is less able to pump out calcium. When calcium accumulates in a cell, in a skeletal, well, in a smooth muscle cell, it'll cause, vasoc it'll cause constriction of the artery, vasoconstriction, that leads to hypertension. But when you have increased calcium inside your neurons in the brain, that causes increased release in neurotransmitters. So the expectation is that's gonna cause a little bit of a bump up in, the body compensates reasonably well. And I think the blood-brain barrier helps with that compensation but you're still tipping yourself in the favor of increased cytoplasmic calcium, which could predispose to anxiety and increased agitation. And I also noticed something, my personality got better, partly because I was getting a little older and wiser, but when I was a young guy, you know, I just come out of Harvard and I was all excited to like do all these great things. And I can remember, I used to get annoyed at people. I'm like, I do my job. Why don't you do your job? I, I wouldn't always say it, but I'd be thinking it, you know? And I could tell people are a little annoyed with me. You know, like I walked into this one private practice hospital. And I'm like, what about this, 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 this is screwed up. What, what are we doing this like this for? This is stupid, okay? And I was a little pushy, a little bossy. And I know that I sometimes annoy people. I could sense it. I could see it sometimes. They would tell me. And I noticed that afterwards, when I became a vegetarian, I was much more mellow. I sort of had the attitude, well, I expect things to be screwed up and usually they're not. And that made me get along with people, but I don't know how to say it, but everybody who knew me too said, you know, I think you've mellowed out and that's a good thing. Um, and so I, I got, I heard that lots of times and I just, I know that things didn't bother me as much, you know what I'm saying? And part of that's getting older and wiser, but you know, when you're young, I would take things a lot more personally and be annoyed and I'd complain or say something to the other person if they were annoying me versus I got older and I was kind of mellow about it. Like, let's say I'm dealing with an obnoxious, stupid person. I'm like, well, this obnoxious, stupid person has to live with himself every day. I only have to interact with them for 30 seconds here. So I'll just be polite and brief and get on with things. And so what? I see. Do you ever get frustrated how it seems like you have this knowledge, which nobody else, not even your own family is following? Does, does that frustrate you? Well, it sometimes frustrates me that it's hard to convince other people 
to get healthier. Because I know a lot of nice people who are friends, family members, relatives, et cetera, and colleagues, and they're fat and they're sick and they could easily improve their health and they, they just don't do it. But I've also learned, I think it's because humans, we have herbivorous physiology, you know, flat teeth like a herbivore and all these other features of a herbivore. We also think like herbivores. The safe place to be is in the middle of the pack. Like, for example, I got an argument with my wife about how to raise the children. She's like, I just want the children to be normal. I'm like, well, I want them to be the best they can be. And she's like, oh, you're just autistic. You're crazy. And I'm like, because she goes, fourth grader doesn't need to know how to use PowerPoint. I go, it's not that he knows how to use PowerPoint. It's the idea of making a print because he's all excited about Steve Irwin. Remember Crocodile Man, Steve Irwin and stuff? Yeah. My kid made a presentation in fourth grade. He's all happy and excited. That was a good thing. I said, when a child gets excited about doing something and learning, you go with the moment because once they learn how to make a presentation about one thing, they can now apply that to all their other presentations and it's a skill. It makes them happy. Achievement and learning is, is a joyful thing when it's done in the right way. You know, school can be boring and, and a pain in the butt when all you have to do is memorize some meaningless list of vocabulary words. But when you're, you know, talking about something that you really like, like he loved Steve Irwin at that time and the, and the zoo and the animals and stuff. It was a joyful thing. But anyways, my wife would say, oh, I just want the kid normal. You're going to drive the kid crazy. He'll become as crazy as you. I said, look, I understand how to coach kids, okay? By the way, I coached a couple of wrestling teams and they all had the best season ever in their history when I coached them, okay? And so that was, my wife would say, I just want the kid to be normal. And I'm like, yeah, being normal makes a person sad, I think. Learning how to achieve in areas that you care about and you have a natural tendency for, that makes you happy, actually. I'm just like, just trust me on this. And there was, there was a little bit of a back and forth there on how to handle that aspect of kids. But I, I don't know. I think, I think, you know what I mean? Yeah. And is it possible to, some people, they say, oh, there's no point trying to change someone who doesn't want to change, especially when it oh, comes right. to health. You can't change the other person. You can't push a person up the ladder. Uh, so you simply, you know, like I like the guy Kiyosaki, you rich dad, poor dad guy. And he said, like his father used to say, the job of the parent to leave the light on. Sometimes the kid's mixed up for a couple of years and then they sort of wake up, become more conscious and they get their act together. And I also think that what I'd say the hardest things about being like knowledgeable and educated and stuff is that it's weird. But like I said, in sports, everybody wanted to win. We all had the same goal. I sometimes get frustrated in medicine because not everybody has the same goal. Once again, the patient wants to get better but there's a lot of money. You do, you do open heart surgery on a patient, you got 120,000 bucks, you can bill for 100,000, 120,000, lots of money. You teach them a vegan diet, you might only get a couple thousand dollars over the course of a couple of days of training, whatever it might be. So there's not much money in it. Um, and because of that, there's not much interest. Sort of like I was frustrated, my athletic career kind of went downhill after I got injured. Um, and then I sort of figured, well, I'm gonna have this great academic career. But what I'm trying to say is in academics, no one really cares that much about most of these things because there's no money in it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then it's also hard to motivate the patients. But I think you know what I'm saying is, for example, if you were a wrestler and you developed a new technique and you won the national tournament in the Olympics, the entire wrestling community would love it. They'd be excited. On the other hand, if you're a doctor and you figure out the cure for diabetes, they're kind of like, shut up, shut up, shut up. They don't want you to tell anybody because they're making tons of money on it. Do you understand? I mean, they're making all their salaries. The drug companies make tons of money. They don't want some new interloper pain in the butt, new outsider person coming along and having a better treatment because they lose money. So they're not only not appreciative, they'll get pissed off at you. So it's kind of weird, but that's how it is. And that's actually a strange thing is that a true meritocracy exists in sports. People want the team to be the best. But medicine, in, in a lot of ways to me, it reminds me of like of a dogmatic primitive religion. You must obey the standard, the standard, the standard. The standard can kiss my ass. A lot of times it stinks. It's for chumps. You know what I'm saying? You eat a low-fat vegan diet. You cure coronary arteries. Esselstyn, 198 in a row, cured, okay, of coronary artery disease. You know, you keep eating this joke of a vet Mediterranean diet, you're going to end up getting stents and open-heart surgery, and that's not going to change your all-cause mortality. The person who figures that out doesn't get any money for that typically, or certainly not much. Right, right. So it's sort of like, how can you achieve in a system that doesn't want you to achieve. It's hard. So you write books and you make internet videos and <laughs> <laughs> no one notices anyways. It's about oh, how it goes. I disagree. Lots of people are noticing. I want to go back to the point where you mentioned how the wrestling teams you coach end up having their best season ever. How do you coach someone to become their best? Well, I think the secret is you analyze the sport and you figure out what is it that makes a difference. And I had the greatest role model for me was David Schultz, the wrestler. He was my coach at Stanford. He was national champion at that time. He went on to become world and Olympic champion. 
So when the team met the wrestlers at the beginning of the first season, they took us out to the hills, you know, and we would run sprints on the hills. He was slow. He was also his off season. He's a little fat. Then we go to the weight room. We lift weights, you know, doing squats, bench press, all this other stuff. And he's weak. And I'm like, this guy's fat. He's weak and he's slow. How did he get to be national champion? And what he had done was he had figured out the secret of wrestling is technique. Kind of like what Bruce Lee is to martial arts. That's what he was to wrestling. You can only get about, you know, maybe 10% better condition than someone else. You can get about 10% stronger in the weight room. You can get maybe about 10% quicker with some technical stuff, but you can't get a big gap. And some people are going to have more natural ability in those areas or be well trained in them themselves. But in technique, you could be a thousand times better than your other wrestler in technique. So he figured that out. And since a young age, since grade school, he devoted himself to becoming the best technical wrestler in the world. So he had this giant advantage on everybody else. So what am I trying to say is, if you want to train excellence, try to figure out what's the thing where there's a potential for logarithmic improvement, not just analog improvement. That's one thing. The second thing is a person has to feel it in their bones. This is what is good. This is what counts. It is a great honor to be a great wrestler. And I think it used to be that way. There was kind of a sense that the football players and the wrestlers, they went and they fought for your school. And I remember in my high school, there was something honorable about it, especially the football players got a lot more glory and glamour than the wrestlers did. But, you know, there was some glory and glamour to it. Okay, and what am I trying to say is a society that rewards that, a, a, a group, a peer group that thinks that same way, that motivates people to achieve. Um, like I didn't like it one time when I was at Stanford to be like an article saying, why should football players get scholarships? You know, that type of attitude lowers the enthusiasm and the support and the support of glory for the athlete, if you will. Okay, uh, football players get a lot of head trauma. That's why I'm not, even though it's a ton of fun to play football, it's not good for head trauma. That's a problem with sports. Okay, but getting back to like, how do I motivate people? Well, they have to believe that this is worth doing. They have to want to put the effort in because there's a saying by, you know, Johann von Wolfgang Goethe. He said, in order for a man to master something complex, he must love it. And I think that's true because there's always a lot of tedious drudgery you have to go through to become a real expert in a complex thing. So having that love of, the, of, that love of it helps, okay? And I can remember, like I said, for biochemistry, I didn't just want to learn biochemistry because you want to get a good grade in it so you can do okay on your MCAT and you can get into med school. No, I was felt that biochemistry is the language of God that he uses to write the book of life. I want to be a great doctor, a great scientist, so I have to learn this. And I thought it was beautiful. And because I, I was like the best biochemistry student in the entire United States, not just in my class. And, and the reason I say this was, if you're excited about it. Also, did I tell you about the book, The Sorrows of Young Werther? Young Werther was this guy in love with a girl named Charlotte. And he had a friend named Wilhelm. This was written by Goethe in about 1800. And we keep writing letters to the woman. Oh, I love Charlotte. The way she walks, the way she talks, the way she dresses, the way she interacts with her sibling. He's just going on and on about how much he loved her. And what I'm trying to say is, fall in love with biology. Fall in love with biochemistry that way. You'll be the best student in the United States, okay? You, if you love the thing, then you want to absorb every little detail. It's never a burden. It's always a joy to spend time with that subject. And so I'm saying those types of things lead to greatness, okay? Dave Schultz was a fat little kid. He was dyslexic. The other kids would bully him. You're stupid. You can't read. You're a fat ass, okay? And so he was always getting picked on. And then he found wrestling, which he had a knack for, and he put all this extra time into it. He was actually the best wrestler in the United States in high school. He pinned Chuck Yagla, the University of Iowa national champion, college NCAA champ, he was in high school. He caught him to throw and pinned him one open nationals. That's incredible. I've never heard of that before. That's like an unbelievable thing to do. And what I'm trying to say is it came from a fat kid getting teased when he was young and being unhappy about it and, you know, becoming a wrestler and then, you know, building himself up. So I think that it's good to be enthusiastic. It's good to have a clear sense of what your goals are. And I actually think it's good to set goals high. I mean, you don't want to be unrealistic right at the beginning, but to aspire to the higher goal, even though, you know, it's still a long way away that generates more energy. You know, if your goal is only, well, I hope I at least get a B in this class. Well, then that's not the same. I would always try to get an A plus in the class. And I wouldn't, it wasn't so much I was going for the grade. I was trying to master the material. I wanted to really learn the material. Like for biochemistry, the night before the class in, in, in med school, I would try to read as much as I could about it. I call that pre-reading to master the subject as well as I could in advance to get all the vocabulary so that when I go to the lecture, I wanted it to be as much like a review as possible. When you know all the terminology, you can make abbreviations for stuff so you can keep up with the teacher. And I would think of myself as like a goalie. I would always sit in the front row, no distractions, no bullshit, no phones, no laptops, none of this crap. I'd sit in the front row, I'd write my notes out in pen. I think that you, you can remember better from that. And I'd be like looking at him. And I would, I would also say things to myself to get psyched up. I'm like, 
you're old, you're putting you out the pasture because I was intimidated by my biochemistry professors. And I'd be thinking, I'm young, I'm the future, okay? And then I would try to not, not let him get stuff past me. And, and this attitude, I know it sounds a little crazy, but when I did all this, I would all of a sudden, I went from, you know, only getting about 15% of the material when I started out that I would, I would soak up like 85% of it or, or, you know, somewhere in that ballpark, 80 to 90% of it. And I would only have to review a little bit afterwards. It really helped. And it was kind of fun for me. Going to class was a big deal. I would never miss a class. I was excited to go to class. Um, I got a copy of the old notes. Uh, we call them the cooperative notes when I was in med school. So that enabled me to read something that most of the time was pretty close to what they were going to be talking about anyways. I would have a couple different books and I try to look everything up, try to understand it from several different books. I'd ask myself, what is the essential feature of this individual, let's say biochemical cycle, glycolysis, for example, it's where does the phosphate go? Okay, well, anyways, that's the type of thing that leads to a dramatic improvement because lots of people have high IQs. I actually think that's kind of a not that useful, that concept so much. Was when you have good study skills and you're excited and you do all these things, you dramatically raise your IQ, okay? And I know there's lots of doctors, for example, I talk to them all the time and they understand things real fast, but they could give a rat's ass about anything beyond what they need to know right at the moment to generate their billing code and to not get sued, okay? Versus if you've got a deeper curiosity, what causes diabetes? What causes dementia? What causes hypertension? Then you're motivated to do all this deep reading, mechanistic reading, and that it doesn't happen immediately, but it happens over time that later on gives you other insights into other things. You know, for example, I'm looking at all these brains, I'm seeing all these microbleeds in hypertensive patients, hypertension increases the risk of glaucoma, there's hypertensive retinopathy. I'm like, this is bullshit. It's not matching the patterns of cerebral amyloid angiopathy. It's the same thing as it's happening in the eye. And I started reading, I saw all these diseases matching up in the brain as what was happening in the eye. Because there's all these claims that they're all separate diseases. No, they're the same thing happening in the eye, happening in the brain, pretty much not exactly, but close to it because the anatomy is a little bit different, but they're about the same. So what I'm trying to say is it was that underlying curiosity and that open analysis. I don't care. I mean, I listen to what the books say, but the books are wrong quite often. That's another thing people think, oh, the medical textbook is correct. No, I can, I can guarantee you tons of medical textbooks are all wrong on major things, not on minor things, on major things. And when you open your eyes and you say, this does not match what the book says. How come my cerebral amyloid angiopathy patient does not have a characteristic pattern of cerebral microbleeds? Well, it's bullshit because this is hypertension. This is not cerebral amyloid angiopathy. So what I'm trying to say is like that, I'm very comfortable refuting textbooks because I know how wrong they are. Like I went back to the pathology book. It's not just wrong in one chapter. It's wrong in 10 chapters in a row. It's a piece of crap. It's a joke, okay? Um, but it takes time to get to that point. The curve on learning something is you start initially going up fast. And that's the joy of a new thing. You're like, wow, this is cool. This is exciting. Maybe I'll do this. And then you hit the flat plateau and you're like, oh God, this is tedious. This is boring. This is a pain in the ass. This is going to take years to really learn this. But what happens is if you stick with it and you really like it, all of a sudden you get to this new phase of expertise where you can see things objectively and creatively. Oh, gee, well, maybe this paper's wrong. Maybe I could write a paper. Maybe this is like what I've seen over here. And that kind of becomes fun. Yeah, definitely. And I think a lot of people, most people aren't born thinking, oh, I'm interested in knowing how to be super healthy or interested in veganism, but they all come to it through their own either personal health crisis or they want to improve their athletic and cognitive performance. So it's great how you shed light on how a plant-based diet helps people in all these domains. Yeah, no matter what you do, you're going to be exposed to some toxins. You're going to be EMF'd. OK, you're going to be exposed to some toxic stuff you don't want to. You're going to be inhaling some air pollution. So you might as well improve everything you can, because what most people don't realize is that most Americans don't age well. I can tell you, most of the people I know over 50, they're fat and they're cognitively slower than they used to be. So you don't want to go there. And I can tell you, I had an internal medicine friend and she told me that just about all of her patients over 60 are all cognitively impaired. Tons of these old people, they're real slow. They still have pleasant social skills. Hi, yes but they really slow and they don't understand things. Um, and I think the whole population in general is kind of dumbed down for multiple reasons, you know, F minus in the water, air pollution with aluminum and stuff, um, all these subsidized <laughs> foods that I think end up lowering IQ, like from their, their, their fed baby formula since they're a kid with aluminum and uh, hexane, all this other stuff. Um, and I say that because you go back to the 1800s, people are reading, you know, 700 to 1,000 page books pretty routinely. Les Miserables, Victor Hugo, Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky, um, and the long, you know, Charles Dickens, you know, books like Tale of Two Cities and whatnot. Versus, can you imagine anybody you know, how many people you know right now would be quite happy reading a 700 page book? I realize there's lots of other distractions and things to do, but I'm also saying is I don't see this intellectual tenacity 
that I think I used to see and that I certainly have read about extensively in uh, previous generations, like in the 1800s, it was incredible. I think the 1800s was like up here culturally and intellectually compared to where we are now. Yeah. Who do you think in today's modern society are the most protected people from all the harms of pollution, EMFs, and so forth? Well, you know, I joke that the best way to live is like Adam and Eve, but with indoor heating and plumbing. Um, I think that's what you want. We're made to be that way. We're also made to get along men and women together. Okay. There's a lot of stuff in modern society that's kind of pulling men and women away from each other. I think that's not in our best interest. Okay. Because men and women got different skills. They got different personalities and having a family is a joyful thing. I mean, that's about, you ask anybody that's older, almost all of them are going to tell you there was some of the greatest joys in their life was having a family. Okay. And so I think women have kind of been tricked into thinking that their job is where their happiness is going to come from. All oh, bullshit. It might be fun up until you're about 30 because you get to see your friends every day and it's kind of fun. You joke around, but guess what ends up happening? All your friends go off and get married, start having kids. And you're like, well, gee, maybe I should get married. Maybe I should have a kid. Um, and everything becomes routine after a while. You've been to the restaurants, you've done a little traveling, and now there's some longing inside you. Our ancestors, as soon as they had their menstrual period, they're pregnant, you know, the next year. Well, it depends on the society, but not too long after that, okay? So it's a pretty natural, joyful thing, and it gets everybody working together, helping each other. So I think this idea, you know, where's a woman at her job, you know, she thinks, oh, it's so great until she's 30 because she sees her friends. But for the man or for the woman, you get a little further down. Most people, their jobs are tedious. They just do it because they need the money. They could be fired at any time. It's really not as great a thing as it pretends to be, as it, as it seemed to be when they were 20. You know, We certainly need money. We got to pay our bills. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of joy in the relationships that come between man and women and having families. Definitely. Like, yeah. All right. Well, we are at the end of time. But thank you so, so very much for just elaborating on so many things from food to gender roles to <laughs> school to the reality behind the medical system. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for being a scholar and sharing your work. Yeah, I did have. I'm going to show one thing, though, just because you had asked me about this one book. I don't think you can see it here. It's called yes. Iron in Your Heart by Laufer. This guy's a biochemist at Harvard who wrote this book about iron. The reason I showed it is for women who are anemic, he goes into extensive detail about why they are anemic. Are, is the criteria actually correct? What can be done about it? So if anybody cares about that, or we could talk about that maybe in, in the future sometime, but this is the best book on that subject. Oh, thank you. Yes, yes. There were some questions we didn't get to, but that will roll over into next time. So no worries. Sure, sure. And thank you. Okay, for well, it was, it was a book. pleasure. It was always nice chatting with you. All right. Have a great day. Bye.